open the windows, Matilda, while I remove the dust sheets from the furniture. Yes. The poor girl will have been so shaken up in the coach. It is 12 miles from Manchester. Ought we to light a fire, do you suppose? A fire? In the morning? Our guest gave us a deal of information in her letter, but I saw no mention of her being ill. We said there was always a room for her in Cranford. We told her there was nothing we liked more than having visitors. some cologne on a handkerchief. I fear her head might ache. She wrote in such distress. There were exclamation marks. There's a cock pulling off! It's her! Miss Deborah. Miss Matty. Miss Mary Smith, it is a pleasure to see you in Cranford once again. You did receive my letter, asking if I might stay. It was delivered but an hour ago. Mary, dear. You were so grown. So very like your dear Mama. Are you sure my coming is not a trouble to you? A trouble? It is a joy to us that your stepmother can spare you. Now that there are so many little Smiths at home, Four already. Five. Five. The eldest, barely seven. My father, he sent you these. Oranges. We came to Manchester by railway, just last night. By railway? Indeed. You want some washed? I saw this in bloom in the garden. I thought it might look nice beside your bed. You're so kind. Oh, Mary. You must miss your home. I must. Which is something of a nonsense after all that was said before I left to come here. And I cannot even tell you what was said because it will only confirm all my faults. I'm quite sure you can have no faults. I'm indiscreet, Miss Matty and incautious, and I do not appreciate my stepmother's attempts to marry me off. You don't wish to marry? No. At least not yet. I'm quite sure no malice is intended. This is the room you slept in as a child. I've always remembered my visits with my mother. We've always liked receiving your letters. You have such a sprightly turn of phrase. I have loved hearing news from Cranford in my turn. I've relished everything Miss Deborah wrote. She models her tone on that of Dr. Johnson. Did she recount to you the death of the parish bull? She did. It was more compelling than a novel. And now it is you who will send the news to Manchester. There will be a great deal to occupy your pen. Though I regret you missed the incident last week. A wagon of bricks had caused to drive down King Street and became lodged with a pig cart that headed the opposite way. Were people hurt? No, 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 no. But there was talk of summoning the constable. Oh, the time. Make haste. You must gird your loins. It is all going, Cranford. <laughs> Calling hours are between 12 noon and 3. No one will stay more than a quarter of an hour, just as you will not linger when you pay calls in return. How will I know when a quarter of an hour has passed? Am I to keep looking at the clock? No, that would be extremely impolite. You must keep thinking about the time and not allow yourself to forget it in the pleasure of conversation. But nobody will call today. They will content themselves in sending compliments and allow you time to recover from your journey.
Do you like to read, Mary? Oh, very much. I consider reading a most worthwhile occupation. After dinner, when there are no guests. But we are liberal with our candles here. We light two each evening. Dr. Morgan's at the door. Dr. Morgan's at the door, madam. Dr. Morgan? But we are not ill. Have you changed your caps? Observe the clock, Martha. Calling hours have commenced. I have, over many years in practice, acquired more patience than I fear I am able to serve well. Ladies, it is time for a change. A change? Do you plan to retire from practice? I do not, Miss Matty. But my cousin's son, Dr. Harrison, is to join me here in Cranford. Your cousin's son? He is not, I take it, a gentleman of mature years. He has only recently concluded his training at Guy's Hospital in London. London? He studied beneath Sir Astley Paston Cooper, one of our most eminent surgeons. But you are, of course, both assured of my continued attention, madam. Well, have you the leisure to speak to all of your patients in person before the new young gentleman arrives? I'm afraid I have not. But I have had occasion to inform Miss Pole. Miss Pole? I shall repair to my consulting room to write to all the rest, and they will know the news by tea time. Or sooner, Dr. Morgan. This is Cranford. Mrs. Forrester! Mrs. Forrester! <laughs> Mrs. Forrester! Mrs. Forrester! Something has to be said. I am a woman of mild opinion, but I'm sure we do not wish to be dressed as revolutionaries. Mr. Johnson has had very wild ideas since he was made mayor. You don't know the meaning of novelty until you hear me speak. I have been asked by Dr. Morgan for the loan of my maid, Bertha, and he does not want her for his own ends. He requests her because a new, young doctor is coming to live in our midst. And Dr. Morgan has arranged a house for him. It'll be kept by a widow who will not arrive for a fortnight, was married to another doctor, and knows all about disease and surgery. So, what do you think to all of that? That there is not sufficient sickness here to keep them entertained. Cranford is not deficient in invalids, Mrs. Forrester. In fact, those of frail health may soon choose it as their home. This young man was assistant to Sir Astley Paston Cooper, Dr. Morgan told me so, and Sir Astley Paston Cooper is physician to the Queen. <gasps> Oh, oh, Mrs. Jameson approaches. Tell the men to hold the chair. What is all this agitation? Are the summer gloves coming? We have had news of significant sister. Has something occurred? I think it likely. Miss Pole is gesticulating. But he comes recommended by the highest in the land. I have never heard him mentioned. And I dine at Arley Hall. <laughs> Dr. Morgan fancies he is getting old, and so he seeks to present his patients with a bachelor. A bachelor? I'm sure I should recoil from his attentions. Her Majesty the Queen did not when she summoned him to Windsor and gave him charge of her state of health. Windsor, indeed. We shall see how he does in Cranford. You are most welcome. However late. I'm sorry. My horse cast a shoe. We limped five miles before we found a blacksmith. Oh, yeah. That's an eye-catching coat. It is a cutaway, is it not? A runaway, in fact. I had it made in London. Uh, I thought as much. In Cranford, all the holders of houses above a certain rent are women. You will attract curiosity. You must bear it nobly. Come about some doors. Dr. Harrison, this is Jem Hearn. The doctor reckons you'll want some folding panels here. As soon as it's convenient. I can do them quicker, I can do them proper. I'm either off my feet. Rough fencing, fine joining. Even people wanting trees locked on the grounds they're made of wood. Not this week, then. We'll see. Unless somebody dies. Because then I'll have to drop the lot to go and make the coffin. <laughs> I would prefer it if I did not enjoy oranges. Consuming them is a most incommodious business. 
There is not such a lot of juice, Deborah, dear. Only when they are sliced with a knife. At home, we make a little hole in our oranges and we suck them. That is the way I like to take them best. But Deborah says it is vulgar and altogether too redolent of a ritual undertaken by My sister does not care for the expression, suck. We will repair to our rooms and consume our fruit in solitude. send the compliments and hope you're not too fatigued from your journey and the Honourable Mrs Jameson and Mrs Forrester have done the same and the Mrs Tomkinson have heard you come and they send word that they hope you're not missing the great me Metro Metropolis? That's him I really am quite touched by everyone's kindness Oh, they always do it Dr Harrison it's not particular to you I will introduce you to the townsfolk gently. Hmm? They are quiet and retiring folk in the main. Good morning, Dr. Morgan. We're doing the door today. Bess is in bed with a hot brick turning. He knows Helen. That's why he's come. The sitting room is to your right. And this one is a kicking key. It has a leg stuck out in front of it as though it's going to kick <laughs> open the gate. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry, have you come to see my father? No, I came to see the maid with Dr. Morgan. Oh, are you the new doctor? Frank Harrison. You must forgive me, we are all at odds today with Bessie in bed. This is a delightful room, Miss Hutton. Oh, I worry it's looking a little faded now. Our mother chose the furnishings before she passed away. Ask him, does he want some cherries? I'll get the rake! <laughs> the cherries grow underground in Cranford. It is the only way to get them down. May I? <laughs> Papa! Why aren't you working at your lessons, Walter? Sophie made me work all morning. Go back inside and I'll come and listen to you reading. Good morning, sir. Might I give you some advice? I would be grateful for it, sir. Buy a black coat. It need not be costly. You can order one through Johnson's, but black is the color of our profession. I wear black. The patients trust black. I don't doubt they think Hippocrates wore black in a powdered half wig. Now, any questions? Might I be excused the wig? I don't reckon that branch is gonna take my weight, Miss Tompkinson. Happen all to go, eh? Come back with a lad. You will carry out the task I have engaged you for and at the price we have agreed. Oh, oh, oh God, the 
This is what happens when you do not take sufficient care. No! Oh, Christ, I can see a bone protruding. For pity's sake, Mr. Hearn, do not move. We will fetch cloth and make a compress. Oh, you must come indoors. I'm going back to the yard. I want in that branch was weak. I'm going home. Brown trout, two pence apiece. Lovely fried. No. Brown trout. Brown trout. Brown trout. No, that bit. Brown trout, two pence apiece. Lovely fried. Brown trout. Brown trout. Trout. And whose stream to poach these from, pray? Mr. Carter! Mr. Carter! I tell you, this child is half gypsy and whole villain. What's your name? Harry Gregson. Dear God. Move out of our path. We have an injured man. Clear the way, please. Thank you. We've already rung the bell at Dr. Morgan's, but he was not in. Show me the place. Bring him inside at once. Damn move. Is it known how far he fell? I should think not ten feet, perhaps twelve. I've seen accidents, but nothing like that. There's a compound fracture. Now, Jen, I'm going to give you sugar and water to stop you shaking and a dram of brandy to try to ease the pain. I'm a carpenter, sir. If I lose my arm, I lose the thing I am. Or will I lose it? No. I'm newly arrived. Is there an ice house in the district? Yes, at Hanbury Court. I'm Lady Ludlow's estate manager. Can a basket full be spared? It might buy me time and save his arm. You, come with me. What about the trout? The trout can wait. It's been here since winter. Because the temperature is always lower underground. What does temperature mean? Whether it's hot or cold. You don't go to school, do you? There is no school. Only the one where they teach girls how to do ironing. Any road, I wouldn't go if there was. Well, I don't suppose you would. All right, straight to the doctors as quick as you can. And if you call poultry one more time, I'll hand you over to the magistrates. Sorry, sir. Go on, run. Keep it cold. It's a new technique I heard of from the battlefield, and it should mean the surgery can be delayed. But I must ride to Manchester immediately. I need curved needles, and I brought none with me. Heard of. From the battlefield, heard of. The surgery is not untried. I have seen it carried out. Seen it carried out? Three times. And how many of these procedures were successful? Two. There is but one safe course of action, and you know He's it. He's a working man. If I amputate, he'll starve. If you do not lock your will kill him in a fortnight, or gangrene will finish him in, in five days. He is your first patient in this town. If he dies, your reputation will be ruined. If he lives on maimed, so will my self-respect. I am going to Manchester. Frank, I will not support you in this. Amputation will save his life and secure your reputation. You will take his arm off at the elbow. Jem Hearn's arm is broken. It's as well he has no wife and no dependents. He came to Cranford as a journeyman. He has no one in the town. He may be forced on the mercy of the workhouse. Deborah, the candle is shorter than the other. Then attend to it quickly. Elegant economy, as we say in Cranford. Candles are a dreadful price. I thought they would be cheaper when the tax on them was stopped, but they get dearer every 12 months. Mm. A visitor. A visitor at 
this hour of the night. It's Miss Pole. It's Miss Pole, madam. Oh, how bright it is in here. You all look very lively. Oh, we've been reading and sewing. You will cast it all aside when you hear what I must say. There is to be an amputation. It will be severed at the elbow with a silver saw. Oh, Dr. Harrison is wonderfully quick. He gave exhibitions at Guy's Hospital. I'm only surprised we were not informed of it direct, given that the catastrophe occurred in our own garden. You may yet be called upon to settle the bill. And we'll take him a jelly or some other soothing thing. But we do not know where Dr. Harrison has gone. He rode out of town and has not come back. Caroline meant the jelly for the patient. Perhaps he went for tar. He will need to seal the stump. Bertha, I need to prepare to operate on Jem. Can you gather all the candles that we have and bring them here? We've only got the two. This one and that one. Mr Johnson. I thought we might be seeing you. Sir, I've come to purchase... He came from Halifax this afternoon. It'll be five guineas. My wife will send you the bill. Sir, I need candles. Cut looks well. You should purchase a second in a summer weight worsted. Sir, it is an emergency. I need candles. Uh, tallow or beeswax, straight or plaited wick? White wax. I need bright light for a medical procedure. You forgive me, we appear to be sold out. You must be able to get me candles. Johnson's Universal Stores can get you anything. My wife will write to Manchester and they'll be here by Friday. 